This podcast is sponsored by Bellissimo Hats. Bellissimo Hats is the number one luxurious hat brand in North America. They make all styles for all occasions, and you can even design your own hat. The price for these quality hats are a bargain, so go to bellissimohats.com and use code SFB10 for 10% off at checkout, and enjoy the podcast. Welcome back to Success from the Best Podcast. Today, we have Josh Rubenstein. Thank you for being here. So Shia is a multifaceted individual. He's the CEO of J Builders, founder of the renowned JCon Business Conferences since 2015 and co-founder and executive vice president of the JCC of Marine Park since its founding in 2008. Notably, he remains an active and generous supporter of his community, both financially and by imparting his invaluable wisdom on achieving success. He works hard to bring the community together and helping create opportunities for small business and individuals. Thank you for being here. And we're in this brand new JCC of Marine Park and it's beautiful. So thank you so much for hosting me. Thank you, Ellie, for coming to do a live podcast at the JCC library, which is uh, new. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be on your podcast. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so can you please tell the audience what you do and how you ended up in the industry? Sure. So um, my time is divided into construction and real estate development and nonprofit. There are two full-time jobs, but when you're passionate about both through some delegation, you just make it work. Right. Um, and did you always have the vision of being in real estate and construction or it came along the way? So actually I never had any vision and um, it was one of those opportunities that come and you just have to seize the opportunity. So for instance, when I got married, stayed in school for a little bit longer and then um, I started actually in the uh, promotional products industry, which migrated into marketing. And then I had this epiphany in 2003. And I said, I have to choose an industry where the top 50% of the people in the industry can make serious money as opposed to needing to be the top 1%. So when it comes to marketing or promotional products, you could make money. And the same goes for shoemakers and the same thing goes for dry cleaners. You could make money in the industry, but in order to be extremely successful, you have to be from the top 1%. Whereas if you choose industries like um, venture capital, construction, real estate, e-commerce, even if you're in the top 50%, you can actually make money too. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the degree will differ. So that's why I said I have to go into construction and real estate development. The only problem was is that I didn't even know what a two by four was. And I knew about construction like you would know how to perform heart surgery. So that was an impediment. But again, I said to myself, no one was actually born doing construction. You learn right. it at some point and you don't even go to college. So at that time, I took the $30,000 that I had saved up over the years and I purchased my first home actually in Marine Park because you were able to purchase a home, let's say, for $350,000, put down 10%. Then you owned the home. And then I was able to apply for a home equity to do the renovation and sell it. So that's how I slowly got into the industry. And in order to mitigate the risk of not knowing what I was doing in construction, I took on a partner for each one of these projects who knew construction and I would tell them, instead of ordering the material, send me to the lumberyard. I want to hear what a two by four is. I want to see if you put sheetrock before electric. I want to be able to request the different materials. So that's how I kind of learned over that year or two what these items were, helping me kind of, you know, transcend into the next phase of construction. Um, that is definitely one way to do it, but I would definitely suggest to younger people who want to build a good solid career is that a choose a career that you could really make money even if you're only from the top 50 percent you don't have to be the top one percent performers and then once you choose the industry find that right company who's brilliant at what they do so let's say you want to do construction or you want to do amazon selling or you want to do um you know real estate uh sales or leasing instead of just 
going to any company, try to find the best company. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of focusing on how much money they're paying you, look at it as your Harvard education of the real world. And then you're not going to be focused on how much they're paying you, but you're going to be focused on how much am I learning? Like if I go to Harvard of construction in this company for the next year, will I learn a lot and now next year be worth $100,000? And that's really how you, how I should have done it to learn from their mistakes instead of my own. So would you say that getting experience is greater than getting an education in something? A thousand percent. Because when I walk into a company now and I say, I'd like to put up a building for you for $20 million, they're never going to say, oh, you went to this college and that college. So of course we're going to give you a $20 million contract. No, mm -hmm. they're going to say, experience what did you build where did you work can we rely on you what do banks have to say about you do you have this insurance do you have this you know people and office infrastructure so it's only about experience right so you i'm assuming you didn't go to college i didn't okay and do you have any regrets not going like do you look back like all oh, that maybe in college that would have helped me or you find that you were totally fine not going to college so I think like everyone else who starts out, you know, the college is a safety net. And if you went to college, you would get a good job to start. But the problem is that can be a drug because you get a drug called a paycheck. And sometimes it keeps you, like, you know, you go into college, you get a degree in finance, you get hired by Chase Bank. They give you a hundred grand a year. How much more difficult is it for you to give away that paycheck and start your own business? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you could say, I'm learning from Chase Bank experience in finance, experience, experience, and then I'm doing my own thing. But sometimes you just get sucked into it and it's difficult to uh, go. I personally did want to go to school. My mother was against it. Um, her mindset was, you know, that if you go to school, you'll get a good job. And if you don't go to school, you'll start a good business. Mm. And again, not everyone is an entrepreneur, but uh, I think experience definitely trumps anything. And today we see it even more, you know, look at the uh, the industries that are successful, whether it be podcasting or YouTubers or construction or any of these, you know, obviously, if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, you must go through that process. But if you want to be, you know, if you have that entrepreneurial bone in your body, then um, experience, experience, experience. All right. And speaking of entrepreneurship, you started, a, as we said before, you started a, a business or I guess not a business, but a conferences that are called JCon conferences. So can you explain what that is and the goal with that? Sure. So once I got involved in 2008 in community and helping people, it started off as um, collective empowerment, creating one voice, followed by what can we do for community? Okay, people need social services, they need jobs, they need food pantries. So we started building out from 2008 until 2015, all the mechanisms and safety nets to help people in need, whether it be a job, a food pantry, social services, um, help for, you know, making a wedding. But then in 2015, again, you know, I started thinking more along the lines of how do we give the people the rod in which to fish as opposed to giving them the fish itself. So we opened a, a brand called JCon for Jewish conferences, and it really had two functions. On the front end, the idea was to give as many courses as possible, whether they be AutoCAD, Photography, EMT, Excel, Microsoft Office, public speaking, time management, any type of tool to either help you get a job or be more valuable in your job, more mm -hmm. human capital. And then on the business side, I noticed that so many people were opening businesses and while they were the guy who started it and did all the work themselves, they were making money, but it was a job. But once it became a business, they were not profitable. So, for instance, a guy opened up a custom closet business. He tells me, I'm doing $250,000 in sales and I'm making $100,000 a year because I measure the closet. I call, you know, I go online, I type it in. California Closets pre-sends me the ready product. And then I go and install it. So I'm making a 50% markup. So... By the time I make 250000 in sales and a 50% markup minus some expenses, I make $100,000. But he tells me that in the last year, I did a million dollars in business and I only made 50000 profit. How can you help me succeed? Because what 
he didn't understand is when you do everything yourself, it's a job. It's just your job is doing custom closets as opposed to anything else. Once you transformed into doing a million dollars in business and you have a business and an office and workers and cars, insurance, everything changed for you. So you're still going with the same mindset, but you have to know how to transform your individual item into a business to be more profitable. Because you have more overhead, so you have more people to pay, you have more expenses. So exactly. you have to take that into account. Exactly. Right. So running a business is totally different. So then I said, you know what, we really have to help small businesses succeed. And that's when I started the nonprofit called JCon, which does a bunch of conferences for different industries throughout the year and networking events. And it's it's a beautiful it's a it's a beautiful medium because let's say we recently did JCon real estate so you had over 700 people in attendance you had a lot of the seasoned people in the industry who came because they just want to network with other professionals you had a big focus on people who entered the industry within the last one to five years who are hungry and they're good at what they do but now those two three hundred are mingling with the other three four hundred who are seasoned professionals right. and a lot of the people like your father want to give back to the next generation so they came as speakers mentors coaches so they said you know what during the networking portion and dinner we're gonna take an hour from our time sit at a table and people can come to us so by us having somebody who did 250 million in construction or 500 million in um, finance or people who did a billion dollars in acquisitions or different people in different parts of the industry they wanted to give back you have that easy open access so it was really a help for all these people who entered the industry in the last few years to succeed and it was a win-win because it was good for the seasoned professionals and the new people and of course you know the income that comes in helps feed all the other programs that we do so it's really a win-win right. And I do it for real estate, for e-commerce, elder care, health care, architectural design, and wow. some other industries. So it's not limited necessarily to real estate, but that was just the one we did last week. That's amazing. Yeah, and I was at that event, and it was absolutely amazing. I loved it. So you. Uh, so you, it seems like you do a lot of community service, right? You have JCon, you have this beautiful JCC. Um, you're part of, like, the governor. I saw on your LinkedIn, you're part of, like, some the governor's committee or something. You were involved in some hospital, right? So what is it that you have? What's the quality? What's the character trait that allows you to be so involved in the community? So I, I think it was a natural progression. I started the JCC in 2008 and started becoming more and more involved in community. And when you're passionate about it, you become good at it. You also learn from your mistakes. You also connect the dots and in order to be successful, let's say, as a JCC or as a community, you need partners. So you get the local banks and the hospitals and the local corporations or people that share the vision and care about specific items. Like we just built a library and a music studio and a tutoring center and a drama program. So different people connect with different parts of what you're doing. Then you build that ensemble. And uh, sometimes it's you have to think always as a two-way street. So when a bank will, let's say, you know, give us funding for a tutoring center, we'll also do networking events for business in their branch. Mm. Or let's say you saw that I'm on the board of a hospital. That's because the hospital contributed to the JCC. So I tried being that two-way street for them. So it's always important in business not to say, what can you give me? Or when you walk into a networking event and say, hi, my name is Ellie, and I do this, and I want this, and I do this, and I want this. But if you turn it around and you say, hi, my name is Ellie, Tell me about yourself. What do you do? Or how can I be helpful to you? Or let me understand your business. People love to talk. Right. And people talk. And then when you show genuine interest and you don't sleep on them, they feed off that. And when they feel that you're interested in them, they always say, if you ask people for money, they'll give you advice. When you ask them for advice, they'll give you money. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, um, it's, you know, and it's an art that you learn over time. Yeah. But that's why I, I do community stuff. But I also created this network of people who share the passion and I try to truly be helpful to them. I remember there was a local foundation who was giving us money for a project, but I, you know, introduced them to meaningful people in the state and they got $2 million worth of government money. Wow. So it, it, they felt that I was a value to them 
So it bonded the relationship. But then when I asked them perhaps for $50,000 to support one of the causes, they were much more inclined to give it to us because it's a two-way street. Right. So my dad, he actually had me read this book. He has this whole company read this book. It's called The Go-Giver. So a lot of people are interested in go-getting, right? They want to go get money. They want to get these properties, right? They're always trying to get. But it's very important to give as well, right? Because when you give, you'll receive. It's a two-way street. So just like you were saying. It's true. It's true. Yeah. So kind of like, so you were... You're in uh, real estate construction, and you're doing, as you said, all this nonprofit stuff. So, how do you, in terms of time management, how do you have 24 hours in a day and get all of this done? It's a good question, and it took me time to get to a better place. Even though I do spend a lot of my time with all this, but I think the the secret sauce is really learning how to delegate. The difference between a successful business owner and someone who's not is the person who says, "Oh, if I don't do it, it won't get done." Or no one has to do it, no, no one could do it as good as I do. Or why am I spending time explaining to that person what to do when I could just do it myself in half the time? Mm-hmm. But as long as you have that mentality, you know, here at the JCC, there's over 25 projects. And then at our construction company, there's other projects. And then at the development, there's also. And whenever I say to myself, let me take care of it, it kind of slips through the cracks so you're not going to be as focused on 40 different items at the same time i read a book it's called superhero syndrome where you want to get everything done and you could get everything done but you don't have the time for it so i don't remember the exact numbers he said but it's like it's better having someone do let's say 80 percent as good of a job as you would do while you can work on progressing other things that you're working on right so you kind of need that need that balance even though you could do better than your employee can you need them to do that so you can work on other things. So it's like that. Right, for sure. And I think it's a combination of two things. Number one, you don't have to do everything. You have to make that list and you have a goal now. If you don't have a goal, you can't achieve a goal. But once you have a list of these 20 things that you want to accomplish, you focus on you know, one or two or three at a time and you make that a priority. So that also helps. But definitely... Um, I'm doing this for a long time and I'm still learning how to even become better at it. So you're always trying to progress and fix, you know, your daily routine to make it more uh, to productive. Correct. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. And in 2008, you had an event with Ben Brofman. Like two weeks ago, you had Bob Knackle, right? So you're, you, you're very well connected with a lot of big people. Uh, what would you say is the best advice for networking? Because my dad's always talking about, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. You know, networking is very important. So um, what advice do you have for someone that wants to get into any business and how important networking is? So networking is definitely, definitely the most important, I would say, because like you say, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I always find that, you know, if you're motivated to be successful, don't think about every event and every opportunity as what am I going to get out of it? Just go, because you never know if it's that last. Like I remember I once went to an event in the city and it was a holiday party from a real estate company. And I'm like, nah, I don't want to go. And, you know, it's just a big party with a lot of food and there's a thousand people in a dark place. And it just, and I said, you know what? I'm going to go anyway. And I go, I'm wasting two hours and I'm like, I'm done. As I'm walking out, I see it starts to rain. So I take my umbrella, I open it up and I hit someone by mistake as I'm walking out to open the door. And I apologized and we started a conversation. He referred me to a developer downtown Brooklyn, and I did $1.2 million worth of construction within two weeks of hitting him with the umbrella. So it was the last person by mistake that I hit on the way out. And I'm not saying that it happens every time, but when you network, you meet people. And today we live in a world where you're always one or two people away from the person you want to get to. So let's say Bob Knackle, you know, so... When I go onto LinkedIn, I can see in one second the 30 people who are one step away. So it makes life so much easier. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the same goes you know, for, for so many things. So be, go to networking. Be always a giving, added value person to other people, and it will come back. Don't always think what's in it for me. Because when you keep on putting it out there, sometimes it doesn't happen right away. But long term, if you think big picture, it will always come back to, uh, to benefit you. That's amazing. So what's the best advice you give to someone that wants to start a business? Because there's a lot that goes into it. You could know a lot about the profession, but what's the best advice for actually starting a company? Okay, so I would say number one, 
choose carefully the industry that you want to go into. Make sure that, again, you don't have to be from the top 1% to be successful, but even if you're the top 50%, you could be successful. Mm -hmm. The second thing I would say is best, instead of trying to open and start yourself, try to work first for a company for a few months or a year until you really learn the ins and outs on their dime instead of your own, regardless of what they pay you, but use it as your Harvard education of the real world. Go to networking events. Um, try everything in life, everything in business always has an angle. So it's never about, oh, I like doing this and I'm going to sell it and people are going to come. You always have to think, what's the angle that's going to bring people together? Like in my nonprofit, I know the hospital needs this and I need that. Or if I tell, you know, um, you know how do I buy a building without paying full price? Maybe they want to save on taxes and I want to get in cheaper. So I'll explain to them how if they sell it to me but stay in the deal, they'll save on taxes and I'll slowly buy them out when I get a construction loan. So you always have to create an angle and then it works. But, you know, and, and you'll be surprised. You know, some people, you know, I've bought millions of dollars worth of property with much, much less down than necessary because of the angle. Because mm -hmm. if you say something to someone else that makes sense, it's less about you forcing your way through, but saying something that they appreciate, you can sell. Right. So I actually heard this not that long. I don't remember who it was from. Kind of like you see what they are looking for in a deal, right? And you give that to them, but just you're not going to lose because you'll just balance it out somewhere else. Like you said, if someone's trying to save on taxes, you try to help them figure out a way to save on taxes but you then bounce it out somewhere else, right? So you're never going to actually lose, but while they feel like they won, you really won. Right. They always say you, when both people come to do a deal, you have to make sure that, you know, that it uh, it's a deal that both people could live with. But I personally think that whenever you put yourself in the other person's shoes to think their side of the story, um, as long as it makes sense when you put yourself in that side, you know, the angle, the thought process, instead of you just telling them, if you, if you really feel that it's to their benefit, like you're really doing something that's true and good, it's going to come through. When you mm -hmm. just want to like hard sell and like fuzzy math, you know, yeah. to make believe that things make sense, you know, it's not authentic. So it's, it, it it's not going to really work as well. Right. And, uh, I feel like most kids, I think this is true. Most kids coming out of high school or college have no idea what they want to do for a living, right? Even me, I'm just trying different things out, podcasting, you know, real estate, trying different things. So what's the best advice for someone that doesn't know what they want to do, and now they're either coming out of high school, coming out of college, and they need to get a job, but they don't know what they want to get into. So what's the best advice for someone that doesn't know what they want to do? So I would say two things. So I would say a guy like yourself who's doing podcasting already, the simple thing is really to just Google it. Get ideas, go to Google and write how to monetize podcasting, how to get more people on podcasting. Take a look at what 5,000 other people who made it in podcasting do and how they monetize. And maybe they're doing, you know, uh, co-branding or maybe some of their podcasts are infomercial type while others are genuine. Or obviously you always want to be genuine, but I'm saying sometimes they'll be paid, some not, or, or, or maybe placement product in the middle or do commercials. But I think we live in a world that you can Google anything. So I would say that if you're doing something already and you want to be better at it and you didn't work for someone else, there's so many opportunities to just copy what other people did and just niche it in your own market space. So if you're getting to a young audience or a Jewish audience or a New York audience or, you know, it, it's really about trying to take what you see out there and creating an angle, all about the angle. Creating a niche. Creating yeah. a niche, an angle, some value. And again, think in yourself, if I'm going to pitch it to him, will it make sense to him? If not, what can I tell him that he'll be like, oh, interesting, as opposed to stop selling me. And again, listen to people, let them talk. Now, if you're not sure what to do, again, think of what your passions are and... Um, because if you're going to do something that you're just doing to make a few bucks, you're not going to be good at it because you have to want to succeed. You'll see most of the people who are successful are not people who have been, my mother told me to become a lawyer, so I became a lawyer, and that's why I'm the best lawyer. It's usually not. It's usually like you have a passion. So I would say choose something that you want to do well. And, um, and again, you know, the angle, the experience. And if you're not sure what you want to do, Hmm, that's a good question. If you're not sure what you want to do, uh, 
Because a lot of kids don't know what their passions are at this point in their life, right? They like playing basketball. They like doing, you know, they like doing certain activities, but it's not, you know, a profession. Right. So that's, it's true. And it's, again, it, it, it's very hard to give somebody a, a, a direct response. But I think if you go into your thought process and you say, what, what, what's the common denominator of what I love to do? Maybe, you know, if let's say I'm crazy about basketball, the question is, how do I monetize on it? Mm -hmm. How do I go into Google and type, how do I make money teaching basketball, playing basketball? Um, and, and if you're good at it, maybe start making, you know, little 30 second videos on interesting things people would want to know about basketball, like get that trend, mm -hmm. you know, going and, you know, between Instagram and Pinterest and LinkedIn. So, uh, you, as long as you're, and I would say also is whatever you're passionate about and you're good at, as long as you stick with it, you're going to do well. You know, you can ask your father when it comes to people who do sales in real estate. It's really not the case that you get a listing, you call the first five people and they buy it. You have to make 20 calls to get a listing and 50 calls to make a listing. But once you're consistent for six months and a year and you don't let go, you'll do well right. at it. You have to be persistent. Right. right. Kiss it. That's very okay. true. So uh, looking back, what's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you first started out? I would definitely say again, you know, I should have chosen my industry, worked for maybe another company, learned from their mistakes instead of my own. But I think there's nothing in life like experience. So everything that I went through, good and difficult, you know, brought me to a much better point of understanding failure, loss, what banks want, what people want, helping people. So I think it, it's what makes you who you are that you can't get. You know, I remember I had a friend who went to Harvard Law School. He got out, got a great job to be a lawyer in the city. And he told me he got a job starting like 200 grand working in mergers and acquisitions. He came in the first day. Nothing that he learned on paper resembled his <laughs> job. And he spent the next year learning his job. Right. So the paper is good. But once you're in the real world, there's nothing like experience. Right. Experience is king, I guess. Yeah. Right. So uh, what do you say are the key... Th this is a very general question, but what do you say are the key things to becoming successful? Because there's a lot of successful people, and they all share in certain characteristics, right? Or certain personality traits, whatever it is. So what would you say it takes to be successful? So I think knowing what you want, learning from the best... Trying to be honest, put yourself in the other person's position to understand their train of thought so you can be um, being poised but coming across confident. Even, whether you know what you're talking about or not, of course, always know what you're talking about, but even if you don't, when you portray confidence, you can be 20 years old talking to a 50-year-old person, but if you portray confidence without, you know, you don't want to be arrogant, right. but if you have poise and confidence, that's probably, I would say, one of the top two um, attributes to being mm -hmm. successful, because when you exude confidence, people accept it as such. So if you, you're thinking to yourself, I'm speaking to a billion dollar guy who's 60 years old, and I'm 18, why would he even listen to me? But the second you put on the hat of being nice guy and knowing what you're talking about, he's going to be like, wow, I want to bet on this jockey. So, and also, if you don't trust yourself, why would he trust you? Exactly. And so. people smell it because if you are not sure of yourself and you're not confident, people feel it and they don't want to deal with you because you're not confident. Right. It's very interesting. So, you know, we were just talking about success, but a lot of, th a lot of people, I don't know if they don't, they look away from it because they're scared, but everyone has to recognize that their failure is does come along the journey, right? For so sure. what would you say is the best way to deal with failure? And also, if you have any stories of yourself dealing with failure. So failure is definitely part of it. And I had my sheer fear, my fear, sheer, like everyone else, of uh, failure. And um, it's definitely, you know, easy to talk about it on paper and say, oh, just go through it, you'll be fine. But at the end of the day, when... When you're going through it, you know, it's, uh, it's very difficult. I remember in 2008, not everyone is old enough to remember in your, you know, age group, but I'm a little bit older, so I went through in 2008, and we had not had that for years before. So, you know, at one point I was thinking to myself, you know, there's some people who are out of a job, and I wish I was at zero. But I'm like, not only at zero, I'm dealing with 
minus zero because right. of all the money out there on paper and the banks to deal with. But then I said to myself, there has to be a silver lining. There has to be other opportunity. Where are people capitalizing on this? So it's, and you should know that when I started the JCC with two other friends in 2008, it was specifically because I was hurting financially. And I said to myself, how can I make myself better? Instead of feeling bad for myself, I'm going to work on business. But what is going to, what, like, how, what's, what's the near future going to look for me? So I said, okay, I'm going to try to make the business work even better and deal with whatever financial issues are going on because of the banks and all that. But I feel that if I help other people, it's going to make me feel better because I'll feel at least that I'm like giving in a different way. Like I can't give a million dollars. But I can do an event with Ben Brofman to teach people or Rabbi Crone, or I started a food pantry. So by me doing those things at that time, that was my way of giving and becoming the driver again, even though I financially at the time couldn't do so. And that's what really started the whole JCC, you know, in Marine Park. And sometimes when you're successful, you want to give back too. But that was my mechanism to, to deal with failure at the time. And... Uh, that's very interesting because also it reciprocates, right? Because you weren't doing well. You couldn't monetarily give money, right, to people that needed, but you're able to give your services in other ways, and it always comes back, right? So that's a, that's a very interesting thing. But also to your construction side of things, right, you have J-Builders. So when you started your company, because we're talking about starting a company, right? So when you started your company, you always have to find that niche, right? So a two-parter is how important is it to find a niche within a market that you get into and what was your niche in construction? So that's actually a very good observation. So I started the construction, um, in 2003. So my first, it is important to have a focus. Don't be everybody's everything. Mm -hmm. So when I started originally, my focus was to, um, fix and flip. So I bought houses, put down my 10%, brought in a partner, renovated, sold it, tried making, let's say a hundred thousand dollars on average on a house. I figured I'll do, two, three, four, five at a time. Like this, you make 500,000 minus expenses or a partner or, or maybe some overhead so you can make money. Um, then my focus shifted and I said, why am I doing a bunch of houses and there's a lot of open interpretation as to what the end goal could be? Let me try to do development because I see everyone doing that. So I started doing uh, development. I remember the first time I paid $1.2 million for a lot in Borough Park. I couldn't sleep because I couldn't even count that far. I was all of maybe 26 years old wow. and I spent 1.2 million plus I needed to spend another 1.2 million to do the construction. Right. 2.4 million dollars like like what happens? How do you mitigate that risk if something goes wrong? But um high risk high reward. Right, high risk high reward and it actually did much better than I expected because the market was only going up. Mm. So where you thought your profit would be x and it was double you thought you were the king of the world. That's amazing. And you borrow, I'm assuming you had bank, you went to banks to borrow money for that, right? So at that point, I knew that I didn't have proper leverage or proper credentials to borrow money from the bank. So what I did was I, I borrowed, I, I brought in an investor and mm -hmm. I offered them like 30% return on their money. So it was a great return, but I knew in my, in my, I, I knew myself that I can make much more than 30%. I can make a 100% return. Right. So I figured it was a no-brainer to give away 30%. Right. So that's what I did. But um, I focused on development for many years. And then in 2008, things started becoming difficult with all the developments. So I just stopped development for a while to wait for things to cool, and I stayed with construction. So the construction model was also stay focused. Not Don't be in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, in Manhattan, in Queens, do one family homes, do apartment buildings. You can't be everyone's everything. Cause I actually owned a few other types of businesses within the construction space. I had a stone company, I had a foundation company, and I figured let me be in this space and be everyone's everything. But I noticed that although let's say the foundation company was making money and doing a few million in sales the first year alone, but I was in the Bronx and I was in Brooklyn and I was in the city and people were traveling back and forth and there was traffic and you were paying so many people to just be all over the place that you were losing a few hundred thousand a year just in that because these expensive people 
you know, w was expensive. So could you have done the same thing, but targeting one area? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you have the infrastructure and you could have multiple businesses, fine. But if you're going to do one item, be focused. So let's say if you're doing construction, I'm going to do custom homes between 500,000 and a million dollar worth of work. Or I'm going to do the super high end between one and three million because those people, their jobs take longer and maybe they can't make up their mind. Maybe they have so many designers and architects, but you could make money. But if you're focused on that, maybe you're focused on just doing kitchen remodeling. So you charge 20, 30 grand, but you have a mechanism to be able to do 20 of them, 30 of them at a time, because you do some yourself, you sub some out. Or let's say, you know, when it comes to renovation of a kitchen, you have the electric who you give to A, the plumbing you give to B, the demo you give to C. So you're just on top of the delegation portion. So you can do a lot of kitchens, mm -hmm. but I would, so my suggestion is if you go into business, be focused, whether it be on location, on the product you serve, and then think of ways to get to your target demographic. So knowing who your demographic is and getting to them, for instance, the retail construction that we do, I know that women on Instagram are my target demographic for my retail construction. So what I do is I make sure not only to post nice pictures on Instagram and tag all the designers and the tile companies and all that who are within the space and every architect, you know, to make sure that it gets out to all these networks. But I also have 57 second videos explaining different things about construction, but mm. added value, not hi, my name is Josh. Hi, free consultation, nothing. No, don't sell. My, my videos are 57 seconds. And my model over here is people are spending, let's say between 500,000 and a million dollars. They're spending the most amount of money in their lifetime on something they know nothing about. Most right. women do not know enough about construction and ask a woman, what other item, because the women make a lot of these decisions, but ask a man or a woman, what other item in your life do you spend a million dollars on? Even the house, you put down 10% and got a mortgage. But what, what else? There's nothing else in your life that you're spending a million dollars on or 500000 on. The nicest car, vacation, you're not. Right. And you know nothing about construction. So I make these 57-second videos, and I say, today we're going to discuss the difference between split unit air conditioning, central air conditioning, and let's say, you know, uh, heating, in-floor heating, this type of heating. And I give them a quick overview of an added value explaining to them, you're spending money on a house. Now you know the difference between this door and that door, this heating and that heating, or this roof and that roof, this window, stucco siding. Right. So I give them that quick added value, and then I'm perceived as a professional not selling them. They trust you. And they trust you. Right. It's like almost when I say Ellie, the podcast guy, or Ellie from Forbes Magazine podcast. Right. So it gives that, you know, right. New York Times best author. So, right. so you and another guy could be, know just as much about construction, but they know that you know, right? So they're going to trust you more than the other guy. And it seems like you're very, I also saw when I was doing my research, that you're very involved in social media. So how important do you think social media is nowadays in any business? So I think social media is integral, but I think that if you're not focused, it's a waste of time. So if let's say you know that you're doing finance and you're interacting with other professionals, then you know that LinkedIn is your space. And when you post on LinkedIn, it can't just be a picture and hi, my name is so-and-so and free estimate. It has to be giving people value. You want to come across as a professional, but you always want to be giving value to other people. Don't tell them about you. So when you go into LinkedIn, don't say, hi, I was in an event. And it was so good, and I met a lot of people. No one's interested. Right. But if you say, I was recently at the JCon event, and I met so-and-so, and he's so interesting because he said this important thing that I think you would appreciate, you're making it, always make it about true value. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see that people are going to look at you as someone who delivers value, and they're going to look at you as an authority. That's very interesting. So social media is great, and it's needed. But if you don't use it correctly, you're wasting everyone's time. Mm. So you just want to show the value that you have for the viewer, right? So like when I'm posting my clips or let's say on, on social media, I should show why 
what I'm showing you is to your value, not just like, oh, I did a podcast, right? Exactly. That's so if you take, let's say this podcast and you say that today's podcast is going to showcase how to help small businesses succeed or how to help people, you know, in any of these categories that we spoke, it's going to intrigue those people to mm. want because they feel that they're the one that are going to benefit out of it. Right. As opposed to you just saying, hi, my name is Ellie and I have cool equipment and I do great podcasts and I'm, I'm, I'm. Now you're saying, look how I'm going to embedder your life so that with the right wording, posting on the correct social media platform, because mm -hmm. you know if you put it on Pinterest, you're not going to get any traction because right. you're not selling a picture of a product that people want to buy for furnishings in their home. Right. But if you go on LinkedIn or on Instagram, you know that you're hitting that right target. Mm -hmm. The right demographic. Yeah. Right. So back to the whole, uh, back to the community service things. So you so you do a lot of I, I went to a JCon event a few months ago I think I think it was in May and it was more to help people that didn't have that higher education getting into a profession that they want to do right so there's a lot of booths set up for all different industries right so what it seems like you're trying to solve an issue right so what issue were you trying to solve by having those types of events sure so the last one we did on May 7th was called JCon education and career and it was for that reason alone that, you know, so many people don't want to go to college or can't afford college or don't want to spend the three years going through it. So the question is, what's the, what's the quickest way to be accomplished? Like you said, you have a lot of friends, they're not sure what they want to do. And they don't necessarily want to spend time and money just going through school. So the idea of the past conference was to have 30 career coaches and mentors and also about 25 different options of certificate courses of many of them that I developed together with Yeshiva University Global, which is an offshoot of YU, because YU is a college, but they also have these certificate programs that we develop together in a lot of simple industries that most of us do. So whether it be in mental health, nonprofit, coding, computer programming, construction, e-commerce, um, management, you're able to take a course uh, you're able to take a course for, let's say, two, three months with an internship. So let's say you're done in three to five months, um, AutoCAD. And the beauty is, is that once you take the course and you get the job, first of all, the course, let's say you took a construction course, and so now you know how to read plans and you know the difference between different items. Instead of you approaching a job and they're like, we don't want to train you, we're not, you know, it's going to be too encumbersome. All right. Now you're worth fifty, seventy-five thousand 75000 to start because you know what you're talking about. So you never went to college, but you got good enough to jump one step up and get in, and then you learn from your job. So it gives you money right away, plus it gives you that experience, and then you can you know, learn the craft. Uh, same thing with mental health, nonprofit, social. You know. So of course, some items you need college, but we created 12 different project, 12 different certificate courses that you can take the course. We'll get you, even if you need a free loan to pay for the course, mm -hmm. And then you, let's say you start paying $200 a month next year. So money is not the issue. The education is not the issue. The idea is really take a quick course, whether you have money or not, get a good paying job, which is going to teach you a career and kind of skip the college. So, so it, seems like, it seems like your you know, college gives you like a general idea, general education, while you're giving the education specifically with what the person wants to do. So like the guy wants to get into construction, but he doesn't have, you know, the college education for it. You're going to give him courses for construction so that construction companies are interested because he already knows a lot about construction. Correct. Correct. So the idea is, uh, again, I'm not minimizing college. I think right, it's right. great. And my kids go to college and went, you know, especially it depends. Like one, one of my kids decided they wanted to be in the construction real estate and it was less important. So they you know, kind of stopped at whatever point they were while the other one wanted to be uh, a CPA and needed, you know, the education. I went to college and got the CPA. So I'm not here to say that college is not a good option. I just feel that if you have the entrepreneurial bug or you don't want to go to college or, or, or just know that the world is open to you to make a lot of money and be very, very successful without college, as long as you're passionate about something and you treat your first job as your college education. Mm -hmm. So find your passion 
and then work really hard at that to be the best at it and get the most education on it, work as hard as you can to become the greatest at that. Right. So once you have your passion, you could either start yourself, but then you're going to really have a hard time making it to the top because you don't know what you don't know and you don't know people, you don't know networking. So let's say you decide I'm going to do construction, but you know nothing about construction and you don't know what you're doing and you don't know the people in the space. You're making life so much harder for you than learning something about it, getting a job. Now you get to know the industry, the job, the network of people. So you just made your life so much easier by taking a little course or at least getting a good job. So that's what I would say. Find your passion, get that first job in the right place, learn, and that being your college, and then life can begin. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So just to close up, it, you have done so much in the past 15 years, right? So what are your goals for the next 10 years? It's a good question. I would my goals for the next ten years is really to try to uh, you know build more residual income from you know different investments and real estate and other stuff that I'm doing to be able to work full time in nonprofit for free because mm. I don't I don't uh, I don't treat my nonprofits as like a, a job but I do have to work in the other businesses to make a living. Right. So I always say that you know I. I I do the nonprofit stuff for a living, but I pay my bills doing something else. Mm. So m in the next 10 years, I'd love to be able to uh, have enough uh, residual income on everything else I do to be able to work full time for free in the nonprofit. That's amazing. So your whole goal is just to work to help the community. Well, on a local level, local community and through JCon and some of the other projects and uh, Spotlight, which is the drama projects and arts you know, different projects for different communities, but I'm very focused on local as well as throughout New York City. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, thank you so much for hosting me in this beautiful JCC, for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you what you do, because I think that you're a beacon to the younger generation that's trying to figure it out. So yeah. A, they're seeing what you do, and they're like, I can do that. And you're bringing great guests on, and... Um, it's just all around uh, fantastic uh, initiatives. Thank you so much. Keep up your amazing work. Thank you so much. Thank you.